In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. It's hard to believe that we are on Palm Sunday. The great fast is over, and this is Holy Week uh, upon us. Um, before I start, I want to share with you some really telling facts about our state today. Divorce rates in America um, have gone up to about 50% nowadays. It's interesting because when, when you do the research, at first you may get excited to see that the divorce rate is actually going down, but when you dig in a little bit more, you kind of get depressed a little bit because you find out that the, the reason that rate is going down more is not because people are sticking it out more. It's because actually marriage rate has gone down by 25%. So if, if a decade or two ago, 100 couples got married, nowadays it's about 75 who would get married. And the rest of them would just live together. So people are wanting to make that breakup that much easier. They're not even willing to commit to actual marriage. And um, believe it or not, the United States is actually not the worst when it comes to divorce rates. There are actually, I did some research, and there are 25 other countries that have a higher divorce rate than the US. And it actually, sadly, goes up to as high as 71% in some countries. I am very thankful that um, uh, I belong to the Coptic Orthodox Church because, as you well know, divorce in the Coptic Orthodox Church is not an option, except in very, very extreme situations. Um, we, as a people, naturally, it's a human nature, we, we just, we take the easy way out. If there is an easy way out, we will take um, We, our nature is not prone to just sticking with it for the long haul and if and if things get a little bit uncomfortable our nature is to just take the easy way out and just escape that pain and annoyance and discomfort and actually i don't want to just focus on marriage but uh, another thing i researched is employee turnover rate <clears throat> a long time ago a person would stay in the same job with the same company for life um, Maybe they would change jobs once or, or twice in their entire career. And nowadays, two years is considered long term. I've seen it with my own eyes. Um, the average turnover rate in America today is 44%. That means that almost one out of every two employees leaves the company. Um, they say that a turnover rate of about 10% or less is considered ideal. And today, a person who remains four years in the same job is considered to be highly committed employee. It's not just in marriage relationships or, or employee-employer relationships, but it's, it's all over, even in friendships and other relationships, even familial relationships, family relationships. People are so quick nowadays to simply dump each other it's heartbreaking really um we are being programmed without our even noticing it it's just like boiling a frog without knowing it um if you all are wondering what i'm talking about i know a lot of you know this but they say if you bring a frog and you put it in hot water it quickly jumps out of the water because it's uncomfortable it's such a sudden change it can't bear it but if you put it in room temperature water and very slowly very methodically over a long period of time increase that temperature just a little bit at a time that frog sits there and doesn't notice the change isn't paying attention to the change and then all of a sudden at a certain moment you see that water boiling and that frog belly up um, we, my beloved, are kind of like that frog. 
we've kind of slowly but surely and methodically and inconspicuously have been trained. We've been trained to be a flash in the pan kind of people, to be sprinters instead of marathoners, to be interested or impressed with something big, no matter how briefly it lasts, as long as it's big, versus something that's smaller that lasts a lifetime. We have been brainwashed to expect our needs and demands to be met within split seconds. If I have to wait for something for just a little bit of time, forget about it. I'm done. Uh, I, you know, we huff and puff and we're so annoyed and we're so upset. Um, I mentioned this story to my congregation a long time ago when we first moved to Austin. Um, in our previous house in College Station, um, our microwave, our house was a little bit older than this one. In order to, say, run at the microwave for 30 seconds, you would have to hit three and then zero and then start. But someone at a certain point said, wait a minute, that's three finger pushes. That's three touches. That's way too much. That's too painful, too uncomfortable. Too hard. I don't know what they were thinking, but they decided to make a button. We noticed it on the microwave in the new house. That's called easy on. Or some of them are called th the 30 second button. So that with one touch, you would get that 30 seconds. Because God forbid I touch the microwave three times. If you want another 30 seconds, that just touch that same button one more time. We ourselves have been programmed to I want what I want and I want it now and if you don't give me what I want now I have no need for you I'm done with you I'm out we have become a people who can't bear any sort of discomfort and we call everything that is not our will and immediate satisfaction to be discomfort now I want you to hold on to that thought we will address this later. <clears throat> now, what variable changed? So today, as we, uh, what I said earlier, we celebrate Palm Sunday. And when you look at Palm Sunday, the actual Palm Sunday, our Lord was surrounded by so many people, so many people, all of them shouting and screaming and worshiping and praising. Hosanna to the son of David. Save us, son of David. You are our king. So many people. And then just a few days later, on Good Friday, it was just a handful of people that remained with him. A handful of people who still considered him to be the son of God. Them and, and the other people who wanted to get him killed. What happened? What why did so many people quit? What changed? Well, I believe that for a lot of them, when he was king, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll worship you. Quote, unquote, worship you. So-called worship you. But when he seemed powerless, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm out. Let's look together at Palm Sunday and see um, reasons why people worshiped him on Palm Sunday. Now, I believe that for sure there were some people who believed him to be the Son of God, the awaited Messiah, the fulfillment of the prophecies. They knew him intimately. They, they spent a ton of time with him for three years, some of them for more, who were his family. They had a relationship with him. They knew him personally. And those are the ones who were worshiping him for the right reasons. Now, there were others, there were some others who believed that he would free them from the Roman occupation. And this would be a great bonus here. We wanted to get rid of them Romans and be free from them. So yeah, sure, I'll worship you. Some of them was because he could make their sicknesses and pains go away. Why would we not worship that kind of a person? Some of them heard that 
this man, this prophet, with one word, could just calm down a stormy sea. Just say to the storm, peace, be still. And it's as calm as, as flat as glass. Some of them was because he could make food appear out of thin air and can fill their bellies on a moment's notice. So they're, they're, we will never have to worry about what we're going to eat. If we just stick with him, if we just keep worshiping him, then we'll never go hungry. Some of them was because it was fun. It's a lot of chanting, a huge procession, lots of smiles, waving branches and, and palm branches and tree branches and laying them at his feet and with clothes. And it was emotionally invigorating. It was so exciting. And that's why they were worshiping him on Palm Sunday. Some of them were simply just following the herd. Kind of like that zebra has nothing to do with that wild herd of wildebeest there. But it's just, yeah, they're walking in that direction. They're over there. They graze over there. Sure, yeah, I'll do that with them. Their friends and loved ones were doing it. There's a everybody's doing it so yeah sure might as well that's the cool thing to do that's the fad at the moment and that's why they were among that group because everybody's doing it <clears throat> and that's the reasons that these are the reasons that i thought of of why various categories of people would worship him on palm sunday what about good friday what are the reasons that people worshipped him on Good Friday? Um, those who stayed there. Because those who were following the crowd and found that most of the crowd bailed, so they also stopped worshipping him. So they left him. Those who sensed that he's not so, this is not so fun anymore. It's, it's too demanding. It's too scary. It's not emotionally fulfilling. It's too depressing. So they also stopped worshiping him and they left him. Those who saw him and heard him cry out, say, I thirst. They realized he's not going to make food or water appear anymore. So, bye, I'm out. And they stopped worshiping him and they left him. Those who saw the weather start to get stormy realized that, well, doesn't look like he's going to be stopping storms anytime soon or anymore. So they left him. Those whose prayers to heal their loved ones weren't going to be answered anymore because look at him. He's on the cross. He can't even get himself down. So they're out. Those who realize that the Romans are still there and he wasn't going to get rid of them, but rather it looks like they're getting rid of him. So they left him. All of these people left him and stopped the so-called worshiping him. The only ones that remained were the ones who believed him to be the powerful king, son of God the awaited Messiah, the fulfillment of the prophecies, the ones that indeed knew him, the ones that made a commitment to him, the ones who made a decision ahead of time that leaving him is not an option. No matter how bad or no matter how tough things get. So my question for you, my beloved, is, why do you worship God? Why do you worship God? Is it to avoid punishment? Because some people worship him because they're afraid of what would happen to them if they don't. Believe it or not. Some people worship him to get blessings. To get the, the, the gifts, to get the benefits that come from being a Christian. They actually treat God like a, a vending machine. I offer you some worship, you give me blessings. Some people worship him simply to belong to a group of believers. They like hanging out with these nice, kind people. 
And so, yeah, sure. I love going to church. I love worshiping him. Some of them worship him because it makes them feel good. The emotions, the warmth, the, the enjoyment of the worship act makes them feel good. So yeah, they go worship him. Some of them worship him so that things may go well with them. Because when I worship you, then things will go well with me. My kids will be successful. My job will go well. We won't get sick. Everything will go great. And you know what? All of the above seems to be working great. And everything seems to be very smooth. And I seem to be a very good, easygoing, faithful Christian when the going is easy. But when the going gets tough, for all of these categories above, everything changes. People get mad at God. People bail on God. People question God. People leave God. People say there is no God. I'm so sad to say that for so many of us, our Christianity has become conditional Christianity, just like this diagram here. Step one, do I like how things are going? If yes, great, sure, yeah. Praise the Lord, I will worship. But once I don't like how things are going, that's another story. I'm out. So if you want to know whether or not you belong to one of those categories of people, well, simply check and see what happens when something is absent. What happens when something disappears? What happens when things go, don't go your way? Meaning, if I stop worshiping when I start suffering, then I was the first category. My worship was to avoid suffering and to um, avoid punishment. If I stop worshiping when the blessings dry out and I'm not getting any, then it was the second category. I was worshiping him only to get blessings. And once they stopped, see ya. If I stop worshiping or going to church because people are mean or cruel or just not paying enough attention to me or not treating me like how I want, then it was that third category. And since I stopped when I didn't feel the sense of belonging anymore, then that was my reason for the so-called worship. If when it's kind of blah and I don't feel those warm, fuzzy feelings when I worship, and so I stop, then it was that fourth one because worshiping made me feel good about myself. If I stop when my loved ones get sick or make bad life choices that I don't like or things don't go well with them or with me, if that's the reason why I stop, then that was the reason why I was worshiping so that things would just go well with me and mine. If I bail on God when things aren't easy anymore and the going is tough, then was I really worshiping him? Um, as you all know, if you've heard me talk before, Romans 8 is one of my all time favorite chapters in the Bible. So rich and so full of treasures. St. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 38 and 39. This is Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. He says, for I am persuaded. I'm sure, I'm confident that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He's talking about how nothing will separate us from God's love to us, from God's side. God will keep loving us no matter what happens, no matter what we do, whether we're alive or dead, or no matter what we choose. 
or say. Or... Also, early in the same chapter, in verse 35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Some of y'all might be familiar with that one. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? None of that will separate us from the love of Christ. He's talking now about separating us from loving God, from our side. He's saying we're not going to let anything make me stop following him and worshiping him. It's a, decision, it's a determination ahead of time. Is it arrogance? No. It's a decision. It's a vow that I'm taking. Um, the miracles of feeding the multitudes. Um, those 15,000 to 20,000 people who were, uh, who, who were the, the people who got to eat. Who were the people who got to experience that great miracle? Well, let's see. It was those who came, those who showed up. It wasn't all the cities. It was people who show up. People who day in and day out keep showing up at church. They keep showing up to meet God at their home altars for prayer, or for their quiet time appointment with God. They keep showing up to read the scripture and let God work miracles in their hearts. Those who keep coming and keep showing up for Bible study or for spiritual meetings, those were the ones who got to experience that miracle. Also, it was those who didn't let hurdles and difficulties get in their way or to stop following him. The Gospels tell us that it was a deserted place. As far as those people, no problem, God. <laughs> We're coming. We're sticking with you. It said it was by walking on foot from other cities in hard terrains. Again, no problem. We're still coming. Some of them came carrying their sick loved ones on their backs, bringing them over. Nothing shall stop us from being with you and coming with you. Also, the third category of people is those who stayed until evening. Those who continued with him for three days, as the miracles tell us. Those are the ones who got to experience the miracles. Those are the ones who got to eat. Some may decide to show up. I mean, that's great. Some may even overcome some hurdles and difficulties that get in their way in order to show up. Awesome. Fantastic. But it is those who remain for the long haul. Those who keep coming. Those who keep not letting the hurdles and difficulties get in their way. And those who stay until the end. If we want to be fed. We've got to be there for the long haul. We can't be quitters when the going gets stuff, when things don't go our way. We, we want to be fed. We want to see miracles in our life, but we want it instantly. How will this happen if we are drive through Christians who are not committed? If we let difficulties or hardships or anything easily separate us from worshiping God? Going back to our initial thought about the divorce rates, I just want to point out that we are his bride. Now, when does that happen? When, when do I become his bride? I'll tell you when. It's when I decide to be a Christian. When I decide to choose him. Not because I was born in a Christian family or or, or because my family is Christian or friends are Christian. By the way, I need to decide this and not just rely on the fact that I was baptized when I was a baby. That is not by itself sufficient. I need to get to a point where I need to choose him for myself. I need to own my Christianity. That's when I become his bride. Our Lord himself resembled our relationship with him as the bride to the bridegroom. Out of all relationships in humanity, he chose to resemble our relationship with him to that. Notice how many times God calls it adultery. 
when believers let other things separate them from loving him and from worshiping him. He calls it adultery, the same term used when a, uh, one spouse leaves the other one for another, leaves their spouse for another. So just like in the Orthodox marriages where we commit for the long haul and divorce is not an option, when we make that vow, it is the same in our relationship with our bridegroom. We need to be faithful. We need to be careful not to let anything cause me to change my heart towards God, no matter how difficult or painful it is. I mean, he's been a faithful bridegroom. No one can deny that he's always been faithful to us, no matter what. I'll just mention a few examples from the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, if we are faithless, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Psalm 118, verse 90, that really long psalm, Right about halfway, it says, Your faithfulness, O Lord, endures through all generations. God doesn't change his faithfulness towards us because we change, or because we do things that sadden him, or break his heart, or anger him, or upset him. He remains faithful. Hebrews 10 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised. Is faithful. So since he is faithful, how about we hold fast? How about we remain faithful without wavering? There are so many other examples uh, other than that of God's faithfulness in the Bible. The entire book of Hosea is the story of God's faithfulness. For those who are not familiar, I talked a lot about it when I was talking about hope, but the entire book is God telling the prophet Hosea to go and pick this harlot, this prostitute named Gomer, and to marry her. And to, excuse the terms, but make an honest woman out of her. When she was worthless and useless, just used and abused and misused, and he would just take her, sanctify her, cleanse her, make her his, honor her. And then because of her old habits, she couldn't help herself, but even after having children with him, she would keep leaving him and going back to her old ways. She would keep leaving him and turning her back on him and prostituting herself over and over again. And every time God would tell the prophet Hosea, go and bring Gomer back. Go and buy her back. But Lord, she keeps betraying me. It's okay. This is how I feel about my people. This is how I feel about humanity. I will keep going back. I came across this painting the other day and I fell in love with it. It shows eerily similar um, to the icon of Hosea carrying Gomer where the Lord is carrying uh, a woman who is actually shows you that it's the whole world. And she has the face mask on and she's sick and weeping and beaten down. We get ourselves in this messes. This pandemic is a result of, of how fallen this world has become. It's not a punishment from God. Well, I don't know. Maybe it is, but it's, it's something that we ended up causing. We got ourselves in this mess somehow. And yet God keeps coming back for us and he keeps carrying us and he keeps bringing us back to him. Okay, how about us? How about we try to be faithful too? When you look at diamonds, what turns coal into a diamond? Isn't It's enduring endurance for the long run to all the pressures extreme pressure and extreme heat but it hangs in there it endures all that that's what makes it a diamond if it crumbles then it becomes dust and ashes and that's it it's worthless 
Another thing is the saints that endure to the end or the martyrs and the confessors. What made them so? It is not how they started, it is how they endured to the end. Hebrews 13, 7 and 8, it says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow. Consider the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So our Lord Jesus Christ, he's doing his part. He is being faithful and remaining faithful yesterday, today, and forever, no matter what we do, unconditionally. So us too, let us decide to be faithful to him, no matter what, as well. Let us not be like all the people who were cheering and, and worshipping, quote-unquote, on Palm Sunday, and yet they bailed on him when things didn't go their way on Good Friday. The book of Revelation, God tells us time and time again that he who endures, that he will reward those who endure to the end. Those who didn't let anything separate them. Those who didn't quit their faith and their worship when the going got tough. I'm going to close with this that I want you to remember. Lamentations 3 and Habakkuk 3. Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 25, it says this. Though the Lord, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. The Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because his compassions do not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, the soul, to the soul who seeks him. Do you see the determination, the resolution? I will renew my gratitude to him every morning. I will hope in him. I will wait for him. I will seek him, period. It's not I will worship him and hope in him and wait for him and seek him. As long as things are going my way, if I don't get fired, if everyone in my family that I love remains healthy and doesn't get sick, if I don't get laid off, no, there's no conditions. Okay, that's Lamentations 3. Now let's look at Habakkuk 3. I know you've heard me talk about this before. I love these couple of verses. Habakkuk 3, verses 17 19. It says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. In other words, if life is bad, if things don't go my way, if nothing is going my way, Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. Even though things are very, very hard, I will still rejoice in the Lord. I will keep worshiping him. I will not be a conditional Christian. My brethren, let us resist, resist how we are being programmed. Let us not follow the way of the, Lord, the world. May God grant us the faith and the love and the faithfulness and the determination to intentionally decide to be committed to him like Habakkuk did. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.